Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is a Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition uh, webinar for the Sup System Strengthening Working Group. Um, just wanted to start with a little bit of introductions for this particular working group. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, I've been the chair for the last two years and I'm stepping down, uh, leaving the reproductive health space for just a little bit. Um, so there has been an email out to the membership for looking for the new um, chair nominations. The process is still open. It was launched in an email for those members. Nomination committee has been selected. Um, we're still looking for candidates who to express their interest until October the 22nd. So there is still some time um, if you are so interested in uh, these activities in the future. The work plan has also been shared and, and it's a great opportunity to get any activities that you want um, out there. So if you have any edits before I hand over to the new chair, please go ahead and let me know if there's something that you'd like to add into the activities list. Um, thank you again for joining us. Today is a webinar that's co-hosted as part of a joint activity by the IWAG, um, Joint IWAG Supplies uh, Subworking Group. Uh, it's for the last couple of years, we've been trying to do more and more humanitarian activities under RHSC. We had a couple of presentations uh, in Nepal that really focused on that, the inventory and forecasting activity that was done in Cox's Bazaar, and Let then the um, pre-positioning topic that was given by the Pacific WHO and the U UNAIDS office, as well as Australian aid representative. And that really sparked a conversation about uh, the benefits of pre-positioning, but it didn't go deep into what is required of pre-positioning and the kind of decisions that need to be made to make it effective and how you compare the risks of the costs to the benefits that are gained by uh, such an activity. And so Liz Nosnowski and I, um, who Liz joined from the IOAG Supplies Subworking Group had been talking about what could we plan as a webinar that would be helpful to all in terms of planning and thinking about how to pre-position. And um, wonderfully, we were met um, uh, Professor and Dr. Uh, Mahiar Eftihar um, he, he is joining us today to do a presentation. He is an associate professor of supply chain management at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business. His um, studies have focused on nonprofit operations management, in particular, application-driven application research with real-world world data and experiences, uh, focusing on health equity. He has uh, done lots of work in operations management and resource limited humanitarian and emergency settings. He's collaborated with larger international organizations such as the International Committee for Red Cross, the Catholic Relief Services, UNHCR, the Logs Cluster, DARPA and others. He is also the editor, serves as a senior editor for production and operations management and uh, received his PhD from um, in information systems and operations management at HEC Paris. And he's done a couple of studies and academic papers on pre-positioning and some simple tools that he's created that he'll discuss that may be an opportunity for our membership to utilize and work with him on. So I wanna hand over at this point um, to Mahiar, but quickly say that we welcome any questions in the chat. I think what we'd like to do is keep folks in mute unless we open up for questions later. And then if you could raise your hand and we will then ask you to go on mute to ask a question. If there's anything clarifying in the middle of the presentation, go ahead and just type it into the chat. So with that, um, thank you for joining everyone. I'm handing over to Mahyar, go ahead. Hey, thank you very much, Leila, for introducing me and for organizing the talk. And hello, everybody. And uh, thanks a lot for joining us uh, in this webinar. So I am sharing my uh, slides. I hope that you can see that. Is that we fine? We can or? see that. Thank you. Excellent. 
Okay, thank you very much again for joining us in this webinar. Um, uh, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to provide you, as Leila said, uh, I'm going to provide you a summary of uh, some study that one of my colleagues, uh, Scott Webster and I uh, have conducted over the past few years related to uh, prepositioning. Um, of course, I'm not going to go to the detail of the mathematical models and optimization. I don't want to bore you with those, but I want to provide you a summary and the main lessons that we learned from these studies. And if you would like to have follow-up discussion, I'd be delighted to, uh, to talk um, about any detail of, of different aspect of this study. Um, so these studies have been, um, you know, motivated with the number of um, uh, disasters that we all have observed over the past few years. So if you just look at the numbers um, from 1980 to 2019, we see that, you know, more than 22,000 natural disasters uh, have occurred uh, that resulted more than 14 billion people affected by these disasters. The affected people, we refer to those people who really needed immediate assistance with uh, food, medicine, shelter, water, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, the problem is that when it comes to uh, sudden onset disasters or rapid onset disasters, um, it's, it's very difficult for humanitarian organizations to pre-plan effectively. And the reason is that they are dealing with all sorts of unknowns. Um, now that we are speaking about prepositioning strategy, we don't know what kind of disaster at what magnitude might 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 occur next, and oh, and where it might be heated by the by the disaster, like earthquake or flood or other type of disasters. Therefore, because we are dealing with so many unknowns, uh, it's always difficult to to be ready um, uh, to run effective operations. When it comes to the response phase, uh, response phase, you know, that has um, uh, multiple stages. It starts from immediate relief period, that is very short, then we have maintenance and control, and then recovery. The first few days, maybe um, a few weeks um, of, the, of the response uh, stage is quite chaotic as one can imagine. And during this short period, the goal of humanitarian organizations is to provide critical responses or critical, uh, you know, distribute critical items in shortest possible time. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, there are a few um, common methods or common policies. I want to talk about two uh, commonly used models. One is proactive policy, Another is a reactive policy, and uh, we go from here. Proactive policy, um, as uh, most of you are familiar with, is the same as you know prepositioning inventory in a strategically located warehouses. Uh, it has a lot of advantages, of, obviously, because you know you have enough time to buy and store the critical item or the item that you want to buy. You can buy them um, at um, low purchase price with reasonable quality. But the problem is that you have to buy and store everything before the occurrence of disaster. That basically means that you buy them literally without much knowledge of demand. So you are dealing with demand uncertainty. The alternative approach is if we use reactive policy. With the reactive policy, humanitarians wait for the disaster to hit. And then they go to the local market and try to secure supply from the local market. Well, it has a lot of other advantages too. Um, you know, you, you have better information of demand. Uh, you can buy culturally accepted uh, products. Uh, you, can, uh, you can buy, you know, uh, items from, from the local market. So you can help the local market. But the challenge is that maybe you don't have enough supply. So you have supply uncertainty. And that's, that's, a, that's a difficult situation. Um, there are other factors too. A price or the landed price of a of, a, of an item, of a um, uh, relief item, is, is, a, is a critical problem. For example, based on some studies um, 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 a few years ago, I think in 2007, 2008, in, in four large organizations, um, we realized that um, um, in proactive policy, the shipping cost from the uh, strategically located warehouses or from the main warehouses 
to the local uh, distribution center could make the total procurement uh, price almost double because that's about 46% to 50% of the cost of uh, uh, total cost of procurement. Therefore, in many situations, proactive policy could be quite expensive. It's not, it's not going to be cheaper for reactive. In many situations, in reactive system, you have price gouging because you have, um, um, it could be because of the lack of supply. It could be for many other reasons. It could be that that particular product is, is, is expensive in, in that particular local market that was hit by disaster. Therefore, in some situations, we have a high landed cost for um, uh, reactive stock too. Again, we have, <clears throat> we have other you know, constraints like the donor's preferences. A good example is USAID's requirement. Uh, they prefer um, humanitarian organizations to supply uh, from the donor country that push um, uh, pre-post stock. European Union has a different policy. They encourage humanitarians to buy from the uh, local markets that pushes for the reactive supply. And um, uh, basically, humanitarians should consider all these constraints when they want to make a decision whether or not they want to have people or they don't want to have people. Um, nevertheless, based on our interaction with um, humanitarian organizations over the past few years, we realized that eventually you need to have some people, either as the main source of supply, if you want to use a proactive policy, or as a backup, if you want to use a reactive policy. Um, and um, basically, we worked on these questions and for different settings. We try to solve this, the question when the organization is dealing with a single relief item, for example, a kit of essential items, and the, the policy is reactive policy. Uh, so PREPO is just a backup, or the policy is proactive, so PREPO is, is the main source of supply. We also solved it for the case of a uh, multi-relief item, when you have the subset of items distributed for each disaster. For example, um, let's say that um, your organization is um, distributing 10 different commodities, but for each disaster, a subset of these 10 different commodities can be distributed or needs to be distributed. Therefore, these commodities are competing over the same uh, uh, budget, over the same shelf, and um, so um, it's, it's quite interesting uh, um, to look at this question. And we solve it again for different scenarios, including the one that maybe some items are uh, more expensive um, if you go to the local market versus if you buy uh, uh, proactive. Before I talk about the general lessons that we learned uh, through these studies, and again, that is all I want to, I want to share in this, in this talk, um, it might be useful to explain how we look at the problem. Um, I start with, a, with a, uh, the explaining the decision cycle that we have. Imagine at time zero, uh, we start making decision about the level of prepo, right? Uh, and um, this decision cycle, this time, um, 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 basically continues until the time that next disaster occurs. And then here at time T, I um, decide whether or not I want to use the prepo that I have or I want to use a uh, local market. I, I cover the demand that I observe during this emergency operations. And again, next cycle starts. Again, here at this time, I decide whether or not I want to update my prepo level or, or I want to keep it or whatever decision that I have. Again, I make a decision about uh, um, what should be the optimal inventory level here. Um, therefore, as you can see, the lengths of decision cycles vary. Uh, there are other points to know. At the beginning of each um, um, you know, uh, decision cycle, I know my initial budget. And obviously, I might receive some you know, incoming uh, a budget during the time before the disaster hit. And of course, uh, uh, for some organizations, there is always emergency fund. So maybe I receive emergency fund and I don't know how much. Therefore, uh, we are dealing with uh, multiple sources of uncertainty. Time to next disaster, I don't know. Uh, the magnitude of demand, I don't know. And uh, the local, the amount of local supply, there is uncertainty with that. And the amount of emergency fund, again, there's uncertainty with that too. So, 
if we consider this question at a very high level, I have a cost function with some uh, um, uh, limitations, but, but I can translate it into plain language that we have the cost of shortage, uh, we have the cost of uh, reactive purchase, we have, we have the cost of proactive purchase, and finally holding cost, and that creates my total cost. If you have any question, uh, yes, Leila, you have a question? Yeah, I'm seeing a question from John yeah. Berkovich. And yes. I think he's asking for the uh, regarding cost of transport and how you account for that. And I think- That's a, that's a yeah, very yeah. good question. Do you want to continue or I should? Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so the cost of transport is hidden in the cost of uh, proactive uh, purchase. So if you remember a few slides ago, I showed the, the shipment from the, uh, from the main distribution center to the local distribution centers, right? And that was one of the reasons that the, the cost of prepo increases. Uh, therefore, we consider the cost of transport in, you know, hidden here in the cost of proactive purchase. So basically the cost of proactive purchase is the landed cost of prepo, in, prepo item. And the cost in reactive? I, I'd imagine to the emergency from a, a freight forwarder cost, for example, what we saw with COVID, right, and still seeing with COVID with freight costs being high after an emergency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that you just brought a third option uh, that humanitarians have. Uh, so for the two options that here we consider, uh, we consider buying from the close by market so that you don't have freight. Um, you might have maybe maybe at you know uh, at most you might have land transportation uh, from nearby uh, you know uh, markets. So the cost of transportation is not much. Uh, versus prepo, where the cost of transportation could be large because you use uh, air mode. But um, there is also possibility that um, uh, you buy from international market. Uh, but after, uh, uh, you know, the occurrence of disaster, that option is not considered here in this model. Follow-up question? Should I continue? Please continue. Thank you. Uh, so here, after solving this question, we have the optimal prepo level. Uh, for different scenarios, but the lessons that we learn are, um, I would uh, I would like to categorize them into three uh, three groups. The first is that um, the key elements or the key uh, factors that um, um, uh, determine our inventory model. There are two critical factors that determine at the high level determine our inventory model. One is the total landing price that changes our preferences versus, um, you know, if, if I want to go to proactive or if I want to go to the reactive and the total budget available. Um, uh, why these two factors change? Um, um, well, you know, if you have the landing price, uh, if you consider the landing price, um, it changes the preferences of the objective function. Uh, again, I don't want to go uh, uh, to the detail of it, but um, um, it's, it's interesting to see that the landing price completely changed the preference of the, of the model. But it is interesting, more interesting to talk about the total budget. Uh, the total budget that you have uh, determine uh, what inventory model you want to use. And that is because all the time um, on, on the core of this um, uh, problem, we have this trade-off between the cost of excess local budget versus the cost of uh, insufficient local budget. What does it mean? Uh, the cost of excess local budget is when you have a lot of money in the, you know, um, during the time of disaster, uh, you don't have enough prepo, you have a lot of money, but uh, you had a lot of money hoping that you can buy whatever you want from the local market, but there is no enough uh, supply in the market. Versus there is supply in the market, but you don't have enough money. You don't have enough money because you already spent uh, uh, your, your budget to secure expensive people. And therefore, the core of this problem is this trade-off, how you want to assign the, the limited budget that you have. 
And in some situation, it actually gets even more complicated. So if I have enough budget, I have a simple trade-off. But if I, if I don't have enough budget, the trade-off gets uh, even more complicated. Um, so um, um, I also created this, um, this table that might provide uh, further about the differences between these two uh, group of policies. So for example, if you decide to have a reactive policy um, and you know based on the experience or based on what you know about your organization, you don't have typically um, uh, sufficient budget, what you should do, what is, what is the formula to follow uh, for, uh, to determine the optimal level of people? Um, if you have reactive, but you know that you have a large organization, you have a lot of budget. So rather, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I just said uh, in reverse, if you have here, if you have insufficient budget, what you should do, if you have sufficient budget, what you should do. Also, if you are going to use a proactive policy, then again, uh, what is what is the what is the uh, formula to follow? Here, you see that um, we also consider the impact of different variables on the level of prepo in case that, for example, we use a reactive policy and we have sufficient budget. And again, the impact of this particular uh, variable, if I use a proactive policy and for instance, I have insufficient budget. So um, for some of these, you see that basically the, the, the direction is pretty clear. For example, if you know average local supply, the impact of average local supply. If it increases, what would be the impact of this variable uh, on um, the prepo level if I follow a reactive policy and I have sufficient budget? Of course, it decreases the prepo level. Um, sometimes you see it is confusing. You see upward and downward arrows. For example, uh, you know, average emergency fund or uncertainty of emergency fund or volatility of disaster frequency all have upward and downward impact on uh, my optimal prepo level. So I don't know, you know, should I, should I, does it mean that uh, I should increase the prepo? Does it mean that I should decrease the prepo? What is the decision that the model makes? Um, so in this situation, um, the model shows us that we have uh, conflicting um, forces. Uh, for example, when you are dealing with the case with greater disaster frequency, uh, you have less time to uh, collect money. Your cash inflow would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you have less time to collect all the cash flow. And therefore, it's a downward pressure on the level of people. At the same time, with the greater disaster frequency, you have a lower holding cost. That is an incentive to increase the people. Now, what should I do? So basically the model tells you what to do, but here in, in for, you know, for some situation, we need a little bit more information. For example, if I know that my organization is dealing with the holding price and, and holding cost, and the holding cost is very large. So then what should I do? Or I know that I'm going to use uh, WFP's warehouses in Dubai or Panama or other uh, spots, and I know that I don't have holding cost. Therefore, you know, there is an incentive for me to increase the people. Um, or I need uh, a better strategy to determine optimal level. Uh, I'm going to get back to this point soon. Uh, but before I talk about, uh, you know, what I mean by a more clear strategy, I want to also highlight another thing that might be interesting for some of you. Um, if you are following a reactive policy, it is also possible to use uh, an approximate solution. Um, uh, you know, the approximate solution is that um, it's, a, it's a very small formula, very, uh, you know, high level information is required and you can know, okay, this is, this is a number that I think it should be about, uh, you know, uh, the optimal uh, uh, prepo level. It's not exact optimal level, but it is, it's, it's a very good approximation. If you follow a proactive policy, we were not being able to, to solve it for approximate solution. By approximate solution, we can even discuss about, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I should jump here to this slide. We can even discuss about, uh, you know, tentative policies that, all right, so if you have, if you know that the item that you are going to distribute uh, has high local price, and you know that the item is very critical, and you know, based on your experience that, you know, most likely you are going to have low emergency fund, 
then what is uh, the, the approximate solution that you have to apply? And this is super simple. Um, I just categorized it this, this way, but this is very, very simple to, to apply in practice. Sometimes you only need you know, two, three variables that I'm sure that most managers have. Let me go back to, uh, to this slide when I wanted to talk about how um, organization can be more strategic. Um, look, uh, there are different ways. First, uh, you know, you have your internal preferences um, to go proactive or reactive, or if you have complete flexibility, that would be fantastic. Uh, you can also narrow down the list of items that your organization deliver that um, helps a lot, of course, because I have seen some organizations, uh, they, they don't have a clear list of items that they want to deliver after a disaster occurs, they are more like opportunistic. And that makes it very difficult to have a good inventory man management model in place. Um, um, third action would be for each region, it would be best that you can categorize items based on their comparative prices, uh, based on the criticality and likelihood of shortage in that particular local market. Um, for example, I have had a lot of interaction with Catholic Relief Services on this, on this model, and I could see that managers can easily do this categorization. Historical data, although of course we cannot really um, predict disasters, especially rapid onset disasters, natural disasters, we cannot really predict most of them, but still historical data can help us to understand some level of seasonality and um, uh, you know, um, um, helps us um, to, to tailor policy with much, much lower uh, error. And then after you know, these you know, four main actions, then we can come up with all bunch of uh, you know, suggestions uh, such as this one. Um, if you are completely flexible between proactive and reactive model, and then you have limited budget, what you should do, you know, how you should uh, assign your budget. Should you buy uh, the critical items now or, you know, uh, uh, later in the local market and so on and so forth. Uh, the second level, you know, lesson that we learned was that if uh, organizations um, um, decide to have a proactive model in place, it is absolutely possible to have a global model, global inventory model. By global inventory model, I mean that they don't really need to uh, decide um, a policy for each region. Um, and if they have, uh, you know, a prepo as a backup, meaning that they want to go with the reactive policy, uh, then obviously we have to decide about inventory model for each region and, um, um, you know, depending on the supply uncertainty. Um, the typical question that I, that I receive is that whether or not emergency fund is useful, at least based on our studies, emergency fund is only useful if you have uh, a reactive model in place. And in, in some situation, if you have reactive model in place, it is useful, but always, always, almost always um, uh, reactive uh, in, uh, emergency fund is um, less efficient compared to uh, pre-disaster investment if you have proactive policy in place. And even for reactive policy, in many situations, pre-investment, uh, uh, pre-disaster uh, investment would be definitely uh, more efficient. Uh, well, finally, as Leila mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we developed um, uh, some um, Excel-based uh, calculators um, uh, for different policies. Um, and we would be happy to share it with humanitarian organizations and, and help them to use. Um, uh, we are not asking for consulting. We are going to share this for uh, uh, free of uh, charge or without any cost. And we also welcome opportunities to collaborate with donors or humanitarian organizations to transfer this, um, uh, these calculators into simple uh, platform that other organizations can just put number and get uh, you know, optimal level of inventory for different items that they have in mind. Personally, um, again, as Leila was uh, kindly introducing me at the beginning of the, of the talk, I'm working on different topics of humanitarian um, uh, and global health, uh, and I would be delighted to talk to you about, um, uh, you know, questions related to um, um, humanitarian or global health uh, supply chain on, on, on wide uh, topics. So by this, I 
finish this talk. Uh, I was told not to speak more than 25 minutes. I hope that I really didn't exceed. I think we have plenty of time. Thank you, Good. Mahir. Um, we have a question coming in and I have a few of my own. So Sangeeta is asking, what about using the framework contract so that it is pre-negotiated but not actually holding the inventory? That's a perfect question. And that was one of those uh, 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 modes that I said, okay, I, I said I'm talking about two models. Um, I didn't talk about two other models. Laila, you asked one of those models but with international supply after a math of a disaster that I didn't talk in this, in this presentation. And the second one was exactly this one that you secure capacity from supplier um, and you really don't own it. I think it is fantastic as long as you have, um, uh, you know, um, you have uh, enough power to secure the supply. I didn't consider that in 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 our studies because um, all those organizations that I have been in touch with, though they were large organizations, they said, "Look, we cannot really rely on suppliers unless there are." like multiple organizations, multiple humanitarian organizations working together so that at the time of disaster, the supplier send the required items. Otherwise, it would be uh, very uncertain for us. And it seems that they had bad experience, uh, uh, you know, from the past. But I think that's that's very intelligent policy. Because in that way, you because in that way, you, of course, eliminate the holding cost, you uh, you have you you have no risk you basically you know uh, hand over the risk to the suppliers that's perfect then. we have another question from zila ebrahami and she's asking how does a reactive model work when you have products that are sensitive such as medicines and i'll add to that the expiry is really critical then and how you manage that inventory i assume but yeah i'll let you so, answer yeah. Yeah, so reactive, first of all, reactive uh, model um, uh, uh, does not um, uh, require us to get rid of prepo entirely. Uh, in the reactive model, you still have prepo, but the prepo, you know, just, just generally you have prepo, but prepo works as a backup. So now this backup could be very small quantity, could be very large. So for some critical items like, uh, like medicine, uh, that um, uh, you cannot find in uh, lots of uh, markets, uh, that literally means that your local supply is almost zero. Therefore, the reactive model works exactly like a proactive model and automatically increases your prepo. Uh, now, um, if you have the problem of expiry, uh, like uh, you know, uh, doctors without borders, um, they, they deliver a lot of different medicine. They told me that they are uh, working on about 500 different items. Uh, so obviously um, you have this, uh, this issue with, uh, with um, um, high uh, you know, holding cost so that you want to be very careful about that. So again, the model takes all this into account um, that you have high holding cost because you have the cost, the very high cost of the obsolescence. Uh, but in reality, uh, in reality, um, uh, if you uh, tailor your policy for each region, you can get a lot better idea what to do. Because in many situations, you might have a high frequency of disasters. So, for example, if you go to East Asia, you have basically a disaster every like every one and a half month. You have something going on, and therefore, um, in practice, you I don't think that you have much of holding. But in some countries, for example, if you think about Europe, of course, you know, you don't have much of, uh, you know, disasters and therefore, and the market is very good. So the local supply is always available. So you really don't need to uh, prepo much. I hope that I could answer this question. Um, Eunice Okumo is asking a question that I had, and maybe I wasn't uh, paying close attention, but uh, wondering if you could have a mix of the models depending on the product and those variables that you spoke about, if they're very different between products, especially with like a generic medication and a non-generic available medication. Yes, yes. So uh, one of the models that we have is um, uh, taking 
both uh, proactive and reactive in place. Um, and yes, we do have that model as well. So again, the purpose of this talk was not to tell you what, how much you should prepo. The purpose of this talk was what we learned from these studies. And uh, there is no like uh, black and white between, you know, prepo and, and reactive. As I said, if you, if you are going to have a completely proactive model, uh, you don't want to buy local market. That is, let's say, zero. And then afterward, everything you know will be reactive. Um, it could be you can you can have a you can have a, a prepo level very small as a backup. You can have a lot of prepo, uh, and um, so so look at the model this way. And uh, yes, if you are dealing with multi relief item case, uh, one of the models that we developed has has not been published yet. Hopefully, it will be published. Um, um, at some point, uh, if, if our kind reviewers let the paper go, uh, <laughs> you will see that uh, we have the model that, you know, basically has both, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, very expensive items, very, very cheap items, reactive, proactive, everything all in one in one framework. John, you have a really good question. I think it would be a good, uh, I'm going to save your question for a little bit, just to let you know, I haven't forgotten it. But I have a question about, I, I loved your tables and simplifying with the arrows based on, you know, the, what you know about your program and what you know about your setting. The historic data that you said needs to be collected, would it be these variables that you're collecting or oh, no. using? No, no, no. So no, can no. you tell us about what kind of minimum data requirements that a program would need in order to try to apply the models? Yes, yeah, very, very good clarification question. So first, let me talk about the historical data. The historical data, I mean, um, you know, collecting data about type of disasters, uh, number of people were affected, and this data can be found, you know, in publicly available, uh, uh, these are all publicly available uh, data. Um, you can you can look at the you know number of disasters, type of disaster, number of people were affected by the disaster in you know whatever country uh, and or whatever regions. Um, by historical data, I meant that. Now, um, for solving uh, these um, uh, uh, models um, that I briefly talked about, uh, you need different levels of data. Uh, um, you can have a high level data that is only, you know, uh, like historical data that I said, frequency of disaster, average number of people affected, what is your capacity or things like that about um, 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 covering the demand. You can actually collect, um, um, you can have more data, of course, and that definitely helps. That is about the historical information about uh, your organization. And you, you, you know your organization. So for example, if you are the head of emergency response at ICRC or Care USA, you know how much budget you have. This, and you know with your experience, you know about the cash inflow that you are going to get. You don't know the emergency fund uh, precisely, but even again, lots of uh, uh, humanitarian uh, managers told me that you know at the time of disaster, I know that how much I can secure as emergency budget. So that is not also completely uh, unknown. You have good idea about that. So if you know those, uh, and, and if, if, even if you know some tentative uh, information about those, some approximation, uh, you can, you, this table helps you to think about the direction of your prepo. Put it that way. So, for example, if I know that my initial budget, and this is quite obvious, of course, if my initial budget is very high uh, or is increasing, or or you know, I have, I know um, uh, where it stands, then it has a positive impact on prepo in most situations. Not all the time, not here, but uh, and here you see that it, yes. in, even initial budget could be you know increasing or decreasing the prepo, and this is because you are not sure um, how effectively you want to use the budget. And that actually creates some, some confusion here, but in other situations, it actually gives you the direction. And this kind of activity is one that you would undertake as a part of the risk management strategies that 
you're routinely monitoring and doing, not something that you decide when there is an emergency that you need to react to. Exactly, exactly. You cannot, you, you know, you cannot just, that will be completely reactive. So you want to revise this um, policy, of course, or the level of inventory. And so for John uh, Durgovich at um, PSM is asking, disaster response may involve multiple agencies who are managing their own stockpiles and budgets. Can you comment on the coordination and its impact on availability of goods and disaster relief? And is it possible, for example, to optimize across agencies? Um, I cannot make comment uh, because I have not solved this question, but I'd be delighted to discuss further. <laughs> I've worked on, uh, I worked on coordination questions. Um, uh, to be honest, uh, my conclusion is that it's very difficult to design a practical mechanism of coordination among humanitarian organizations for many reasons. Uh, although logistic cluster and other cluster mechanisms do their best to, um, you know, um, uh, make organizations to coordinate, um, in, in real situation, I really don't know how much uh, they can really coordinate. But uh, I'd be, I'd be, again, I'd be delighted to work on this question and discuss further. Thank you. Any other questions? From the audience. But can I, sorry, Leila, yeah, can I, can ahead. I, can I share my completely, uh, you know, personal tentative answer? Of it's, it's not based on any calculation, of course. So if you have coordination, you know, assuming that um, multiple organizations, they are doing, uh, you know, WFP's uh, warehouses is a great example. Um, if uh, multiple organizations decide to, to have one inventory pool and coordinate um, obviously, it increases your bargaining power. Obviously, it increases your uh, your leverage to be a more efficient and effective at time of disaster. Um, um, you know whether or not it increases uh, your your prepo level. Uh, you know that's another question. Um, you know most likely yes, most likely yes, because you simply are um, uh, less sensitive to the risk of it because you do the risk pulling. And at, this actually creates something else uh, to my mind, and uh, that is uh, when you have the uh, uh, basically in a, in, a, in a look in a very general model. Maybe it, it might be helpful to answer John's question. So here, when you have the prepo every time at the at the you know one location, um, you are doing a very good risk pooling strategy too because. Um, you know, af after disaster occurs here, um, you have the chance of buying from the local market or switching back to your to your prepo. And if you think that the local market is doing well and you have enough supply, then you keep it. You you use it for the next disaster. So you even yourself, you are doing a very good risk pooling when you when you use prepo. Um, so now imagine if you have multiple organizations working together. Of course, you can you can have a lot. You know more power to. I, I to think that school. for me, looking at this, the and the other coordination activity activities that we've done, for example, SSWG, it's the demand mag magnitude that really can affect things. If you don't have a complete understanding of what the global market is or what the total market demand is, then you might end up competing against each other for that limited supply without knowing how to share across. Those organizations and that's a, a big unknown that's a very good point um so john's comment is so it must be important to assess post response and adjust policy yeah seems very reasonable thank you sankita has another question overall did you notice any trends on type of strategy used, or was it a mixed bag across organizations products who was financing it um and is this different in the private sector or with FEMA? Well, um, to my knowledge, and I hope that I'm not wrong, um, um, a few years ago, there was like this move um, to um, uh, proactive uh, model. I think, uh, you know, after large disasters, but 
but uh, now more and more i again my my observation is to those organizations that i have been working with it seems that they are more interested in reactive policy than proactive policy and using prepo just just as a backup uh, so I, I think, uh, again, I could be wrong, but I think that there is incentive for humanitarians to buy from the local market. Um, we don't consider this kind of incentives in our model. We try to just do the optimization task here, and we don't really consider those trends. Not seeing any more questions. Um... If you do have anything else, and if you're interested in applying the model and talking with Mahyar, his email is available. The PowerPoint will be shared. Oh, John, full of questions. I love it. Okay. Disaster relief goods are often delivered in the form of kits containing multiple items. Yeah. <laughs> there are obvious advantages for distribution. I have a comment on that, John. Does this pose any additional challenges regarding response time, cost, likelihood of expiry, et cetera. So the activity that um, SSWG presented on two years ago in Nepal was how to convert an organization who's been stuck using kits over to limited, um, to buying individual products and how do you forecast for that? And what were the uh, steps in order to do that? So I will refer you, I'll send you something else on that. They're not meant to be used long-term. They're meant to be used short term at the onset of emergency. And that's the only comment I'll make and hand over to Mahyar. So John, which, which organization are you representing? If, if you don't mind him asking. I'd be, I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to discuss with you. Uh, it seems that you, you know the industry very well. So please shoot me an email and, and I'd be happy to discuss further. And uh, yes. So, so John uh, works for, I believe he might be Chemonix. He works for GHS CPSM, USA oh, contractor for procurement. Yeah. All right. Okay. So definitely Chemonix. I have a lot of friends at Chemonix. So please uh, shoot me an email and I'd be delighted to talk to you. So, uh, uh, well, exactly. So <laughs> kitting is definitely an issue. Um, well, to be honest, we criticized kitting in, in our modeling. Uh, exercise. Uh, we thought that um, kitting um, should be done, you know, uh, very, very carefully. Otherwise, uh, you're going to waste your money and uh, uh, you're going to waste a lot of spaces. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't know if we talk about kitting in the, in the latest version of our paper. I have because we had so many revision of the work, so I don't know if we explicitly talk about that anymore in the paper, but, uh, but we came to the conclusion that kitting is only useful if you carefully uh, uh, you know, galvanized products or in, in one kit. Otherwise, you know, if you have items with different level of criticality, for instance, or, or different values, um, it's just more convenient, but it is very costly if you want to consider how you are using your budget efficiently. This, this is this is what what we learned. Great, and it's um, we have another question from Spencer Hershey. Uh, so nice to see your name. He was a student of mine a few years ago. I love seeing how far and wide these announcements go and who joins. So he's asking, is the local model um, essentially eliminated in an island nation where the disaster is likely to affect the entire area? Can you repeat the question? My is, CP I doesn't would, I get think it. Proact I think it may be the, pro the local supply model Okay. essentially eliminated in an island nation where the disaster is likely to affect the whole area. Oh, now I see. Okay, so the whole market collapsed. And then, and then the question is that, well, for example, for example, let's say that uh, country X, the whole country um, uh, is affected by the disaster and basically you don't have a local market. And then if you apply reactive policy, then that means that you don't have supply. I think this is the question, right? I believe so. Okay, um, all right. So again, in this situation, we are thinking of close by markets, meaning that uh, more specifically, um, and, and thanks for asking because it's actually, you know, clarify my language. 
um, uh, we are we, when, when we say close by market, we mean um, uh, close enough such that you can use uh, land transportation. It could be a, a neighbor country market. Uh, you know, it doesn't really need to be exactly in the same, uh, uh, you know, country or in the same region exactly. It uh, close enough so that you can you can you can distribute item, you can ship the item within uh, within reasonable time range, one day or two day from a close by country, and uh, using land transportation that's very cheap. Um, yeah, so that 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 is what we consider in the reactive model. That is not what we consider, that is what humanitarians told us that they consider in reactive model. Does that answer your question, Spencer? Yes, uh, can I ask uh, just sure. make a comment? Yes, go ahead, Lamont. I want to first of all say thank you so much, uh, the colleague professor for the wonderful presentation. Uh, it has given a very good insight on the prepositioning. Uh, however, I think uh, based on circumstances, uh, there could be lots of flexibility that can be employed in as far as uh, handling the, the need for prepositioning. I think we shared uh, lots of discussions with Lelia, and this is a quite a different dimension which I've learned today. I just want to say thank you so much. And uh, we ask that this kind of uh, mentorship and sharing experience ought to continue so that uh, we, we support the, the global market, uh, our countries in responding to this kind of emergencies, especially disaster preparedness. We could really put this as key component of uh, health response. Uh, rapid response, re, re, rapid respondents, etc. Hard to get into this background. Uh, so, as multinational do, uh, donors that support, I think these are uh, the insights we could be introducing in our respective uh, working uh, environments, so that the countries can respond uh, timely in in that. So uh, I'm just privileged and I look forward to further engagement and interaction with you people uh, beyond this uh, presentation. Thank you, Lelia. Thank for you. Me. Then thank you everyone there. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, John, do you wanna thank come you. off? Oh, go ahead. Oh, Let's see. Okay. Um, John Dorkovich, one, one, one more email. Um, Mr. Basil, do you have a question? No, I, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to appreciate the presentation and all what you people have been talking about. My name is Akpo Basil from Cameroon, currently working as logistic assistant with the Cameroon Baptist Convention Health Services. So, I am thinking that these this modules and what you people have been presenting and talking about today is going to really help in the context of my country too. Though we have some technical drawbacks, like probably the government wouldn't really collaborate and the system to, to embrace it is really not going to be very easy. But I thank you very much and I think I've learned a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you welcome. very much. And, and uh, Aqua, I think maybe what would help in terms of advocating for a different model would be to show the cost differences. And if they can see that there might actually be savings in a different kind of model, then it might be a bit more persuasive to change policy. And I think that's yeah. what the model helps do. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. No, that's it. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, so John, back to the island nations or small countries and small markets, isn't there something regional pooling of disaster management could do? Um, correct, and I think that goes back similar to the collaboration and coordination question. I know that um, Australia and the activity that was presented two years ago, which I don't think too many of us were in the audience then, talked about how the Pacific Ocean region for WHO had 
pre-positioned in several places close to Nepal and the Philippines, reproductive health kits. And so given the amount of earthquakes, et cetera, that, and, uh, and um, hurricanes and such that happen in that region, uh, there was some, some pre-positioning within those areas of kits. And I don't know, those are all island nations. They were doing regional pooling. Um, Mahiar, if you have, sorry, I took over the answer, but you go ahead and- No, please, no. Any I other actually, comments? No comment. I mean, it's actually, I enjoy, I, I wish more, you know, others could also share their experience. And uh, again, you know, when we talk about uh, a model, it's not like, okay, this is written in stone. This is one model and this, this model should work, uh, you know, the best. Of course, this is one step. I think it's, um, you know, uh, it's one step you know forward and I, I definitely it can be enhanced but it can only be enhanced with you know learning from others so i really appreciate when people make comments and suggestions and uh, or other so this is again another another important thing i forgot to mention is that this uh, this whole this uh, discussion is from the lens of operations of a few organizations that we have worked with uh, your organization might see the problem differently and I'd be happy to see okay what are the differences how we can we can uh, you know incorporate those you know uh, differences into uh, such model and improve these models so uh, yeah yeah please continue I I'm I'm happy to learn what you think what do you think about the presentation you didn't share any was, comments <laughs> yeah I think you did the fan it was fantastic I think it takes Great. us a step forward and not only just appreciating what prepositioning can do, but what do you have to consider when you preposition? And those simple tables that you shared were really helpful, easy takeaways for smaller organizations like Mr. Basil's in Cameroon to walk away with and apply. Um, yeah. So greatly appreciated. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. Thank you, um, thank you so much. Uh, the recording will be shared. Uh, the presentation, so. Mahyard, I, I think you I, I'm, uh, hopefully can be shared. And yes. uh, there are some articles that will attach to the emails with the recording. Yes. And uh, please move it forward and apply and get in touch with Mahyar for anything that you would need. Definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, the only thing is that we definitely can attach one of the papers. Another paper has not to been be published. Come out. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so I, I don't know if we can if we can attach it, but uh, if individuals send me email, I'd be happy to to email. Thank you so much. And Thank you so that, much for arranging. Yep. We will end the recording and end the presentation. There will be another webinar, I believe that's being planned for another month from now. And don't forget if you're interested in running for chair to let uh, Monique and Brian know. All Thank right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.